Hello, welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series. My name is Scott Miller, and I serve as your weekly host and interviewer. You may know that recently I published a book through HarperCollins called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, where we feature guests from this podcast with their permission in this book that now has become a bestseller, where I share an interesting and I think transformative idea that they shared on the podcast. And the book has done so well that Simon or uh, HarperCollins has now released a new version called Master Mentors Volume 2 on, on sale now on Amazon, launching in October. And today, I'm delighted to have a new master mentor, if you will. Her name is Sophia Amoroso. She wrote the New York Times bestselling book, Girl Boss. She is going to share with us today probably some raw very vulnerable stories of her rise and perhaps her fall as an entrepreneur, as a CEO. She's been extraordinarily generous, I think, was just talking about the trials and tribulations of what it's like to have been a successful entrepreneur and then, of course, have, you know, that business change on you. And so today, Sophia, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So oh, first look. of all, I'm on TV. You're on TV, Mom. Hey, first of all, your, your book cover is like one of the best I've ever seen. So congratulations on a fantastic book cover. The book is riotously funny, very vulnerable, transparent. You talk about all of your, your journey. Would you maybe reorient our guest and listeners, Sophia, to who you are, how you became an entrepreneur, what was the sort of the rise and the fall? Take your time on that because I think along the way we'll tease out some points that will make for a great conversation on perhaps things to do and maybe things not to do from your own generosity to share the ups and the downs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Um, this is really exciting and I love your podcast. Um, and I feel like I'm in great company with all of the founders, you know, that you've interviewed and it's just super exciting. So, um, wow, my story. So my story is so uh, bonkers that they made a Netflix series out of it. So I'll start there. But that's not where it began. It really began in late 2006 when I was working in the lobby of an art school for $13 an hour checking student IDs. I had wanted to go to art school. I wanted to be a photographer, but ultimately it was $50,000 a year and I didn't have the setup that I needed. And so I was working, you know, crappy retail jobs, photo labs, and la at the last job was in the lobby of an art school. And I had time to kill on the internet and I was checking student IDs, you know, Googling in between, was on MySpace and was getting friend requests from all of these eBay sellers who were promoting their vintage fashion on MySpace. So they were adding me as a friend. And so I clicked through, you know, they had links to their eBay store. This was like, there was no social media marketing. There was no Facebook ads. There were no Instagram ads. This was just like, people hustling on MySpace and clicked through and saw the kind of, like the vintage they were selling and the auction prices they were getting and was shocked because I pretty much wore exclusively vintage at the time. I was like hanging out in dive bars, listening to like rock and roll or whatever. And I knew where to find vintage really cheap. And I was shocked at the prices these, these people were getting and thought, well, maybe I should give this a shot. I'm relatively un actually unemployable. I hate this job. I only got it for the health insurance because at the time you needed uh, group health insurance if you had a pre-existing condition and I had a hernia and I needed surgery for it. So that's really why I got that job. So I quit that job after the three months that I had to stick around to get my health insurance. I got my hernia fixed and I wasn't like, I'm going to be a CEO, whoa, entrepreneur. I didn't even consider myself a business owner. I was like, I'm going to schlep some clothes on eBay and I'll maybe make a little bit of money this will be great. Let's see if it works. Um, and so in November of 20, 2006, excuse me. Yeah. 2006. Um, I sold my first few things on eBay at least at, actually the first few things didn't sell. And I tried again and I tried again and I watched what other sellers were, you know, finding success with, I watched what their final auction prices were just looking at comps for homes on Redfin. It's the same thing. You can do that with eBay auctions. Did that and went out and found the stuff that was selling, whatever. That's a lot of detail, but I did everything in the beginning, you know, as eBay sellers do. You know, I wrote all the product descriptions and titles. I weighed things. I steamed them. I dug through estate sales and, you know, Goodwill stores to find the best stuff. Um, I did all the customer service, you know, 
you name it, right? That's what happens. And eBay gave me this incredible framework to start a business, which I don't think I would have ever done without it. And what's amazing today and what I talk to my students a lot about is are these incredible resources um, to start businesses and to you know, hold inventory and do these things. At the time, there was no Etsy, Shopify, Squarespace, Venmo. There was PayPal, eBay, and MySpace. Um, and that got me up and running. And in the first year, I did $75,000 in revenue, which was like, you know, so much money for me. And my overhead was $500 a month, zero employees, right? My margin was crazy. I didn't even really understand what margin was initially and kept going. So year two was $250,000. And at that point, I might have had like, my, I hired my first employee, uh, maybe a couple employees, someone to ship stuff and someone to do customer service and steam stuff, all the things I didn't need to do. And then year two was 250. Yeah. And then year three was 1.1 and year four was six and a half million and on our way to 28 million. And it was at that inflection point that investors came in and found me. I didn't even know you could take money does no one would have given me a loan I had no idea how that worked and they plowed 50 million dollars into the business and I still owned 80 percent of it because they anointed the company with a 350 million dollar valuation when we were not even doing 30 million dollars in revenue and we were on our way you know to building a venture-backed apparel business on the internet wasn't wasn't the Amazon of fashion and it wasn't a boutique. This was the time of fab.com, which I'm not, you know, not everybody's going to remember imploded. It was a time when, you know, venture capitalists were telling me like, do this, do that. Like this is, you know, it was a really speculative time. Um, e-com, it was called e-com, not direct to consumer, by the way. Um, and, you know, so we, you know, did this, picked a, picked a number and said a great 28 million this year. 128 million next year. It wasn't based on any kind of real educated projections other than, you know, the company had been exploding and we expected it to continue to explode. And it did continue to explode. Um, but to have all of these like grown ups in a room who know math and finance much better than I do, you know, agreeing with me that we could just round up by $100 million in retrospect is really interesting and irresponsible for all of us. And so we hired a hundred people in a year. I had never worked in an office. I mean, you want to talk about chief people officer stuff. You want to talk about culture. I can talk about that for the next three hours. I had never, the only office I've worked in, my name was on the lease of. I've never, I never experienced leadership. I never really experienced management other than like you forgot to clock in or like you ran over on your lunch break you know, or, you know, at Borders Books, they did teach me to do this, to take someone over to the correct section of the bookstore <laughs> instead of point, you know, um, but not a lot more than that, you know, how to line up shoes, how to, you know, how to lace shoes at the shoe store and put them on people's feet and tie them, things like that. So that really didn't set me up to be a great leader um, cause I had absolutely no empathy, never really needed leadership to get started and do what I was doing, uh, and had never had that kind of exposure. Um, hired a hundred people in a year, became the tower of Babel. It was like fiefdoms and silos and clicks and processes that didn't scale or no processes, duplication of work. Um, you name it, uh, it happened. And because we didn't start with intention, we didn't start the company culture or the way the company ran saying, this is what it's going to look like. This is who we are. We did the whole thing where we put like a no assholes policy on the wall. Didn't drive that all the way through the organization, you know, was lip service. And eventually got to over a hundred million dollars in revenue um, by 2014. Um, and then the company kind of plateaued and we had spent a lot of money to get to over a hundred million dollars in revenue. The market had changed. Um, apparel 
e-com wasn't as sexy to venture investors. We were overpriced. We would have been great for private equity. Uh, I mean, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into here, but the multiples are much lower in private equity. And we would have been at least for an apparel business because they're looking at those comps and not the Amazon of fashion comps. And other investors wanted to come in. My investors said things like, if you can't, you know, pay the valuation we did, don't bother showing up. You know, an, an outfitter of urban apparel um, gave us a, an LOI at a $412 million valuation. And I owned 80% of the company at that time. And my investor told me to ask for more and the deal went away. So uh, everything that, like I said, everything that could have happened, happened. Um, and then at the end of 2016, well, I'd written Girl Boss, my book in 2014, spent 18 weeks in the New York Times bestseller list. It was the story of this accidental entrepreneur who a lot of people relate to because they can, anybody can open a Squarespace, you know, a Shopify store or an Etsy store. And I was kind of the first who had put myself out there and been like, look, I don't, I shouldn't be a business person, but somebody let me in the back door or I broke in the back door and I figured it out and you can too. I figured it out up until a point. Um, and that uh, eventually became this Netflix series in early 2017. That happened, let's just jump back a little bit to mid-2016. Um, mid-2016, I was married for about a year. We'd been together for like four years. This guy dumps me. Uh, so my husband of a year dumps me. Um, a month prior to that, I'd been on the cover of Forbes as one of America's richest self-made women um, with a net worth of like $280 million because I owned 80% of this overvalued company. And in November of 2016, so half a year later, Nasty Gale filed for Chapter 11 protection um, and was bought by Boohoo for $20 million, um, which I still kind of sold a company for $20 million. <laughs> I didn't make any of that money, um, but still. <laughs> And um, I stepped, I, I, I left. I was like, I got to go figure out my next thing. I'm not going to be like, a, you know, and culturally it could have stuck around and been there and really done the right thing and been there as the company was, you know, closing up shop. I hadn't been the CEO for the last year and a half. I didn't want to be, I, that was my decision. Nobody pushed me out. Um, and so I had a CEO handling that. And, you know, and then I went and started my second company called Girl Boss and did that for about three years. And that's, you know, another three years of history. And today I'm teaching entrepreneurs how to build businesses largely through teaching them what not to do in um, a, an online course that is called Business Class. It's a really comprehensive program. Um, so I've been doing that since late 2020 pandemic business. It's all digital. And it's been amazing to kind of no longer feel my way around in the dark, but to shed light on all of the things that I wish I knew for a generation of entrepreneurs who are largely starting businesses now with the same set of tools or less than I did in late 2006. Sophia, I enjoyed every moment, every word of that journey. Like you, this could be a Harvard business case study, right? Of what to do and what not to do. I don't think you should minimize your vision, your hard work, your entrepreneurship. Like many entrepreneurs, you likely had some naivete. What I, what I first want to do is compliment you. First of all, thank you for coming on our podcast today and showing the transparency and vulnerability of what went well and what didn't go well. I'm sure there's hours of context you could provide and much of that's in what you've written and talked about uh, in the book as well. Uh, let's deconstruct a couple of lessons. I think you can give a huge gift to the millions of listeners around the world that are watching and listening that have a side hustle that might have a company that's explosive in growth, that's looking, looking to build their own leadership skills. Let's talk about a couple of things. What advice would you give to someone that right now ha owns a small company like you did from your apartment, from your home? It's growing. What are some early step business leadership lessons you would say? Okay, 
once you start to see a pivot point, maybe, maybe you've gone from $1,000 to $2,000 a month, whatever it is, what are some leadership principles you'd say, think about this, avoid that, yeah. do this? Yeah. Um, I mean, management and leadership kind of go hand in hand because if you're not setting your company up for success, you're not setting your team up for success. And the things that you do day one, even if it's just a business of you, are the things that as you hire your second employee and your third employee, that's what they're going to scale into. So um, whether you know it or not, even when you're just working by yourself, you're building a culture. Um, when you hire your first employee, you're not buddies, they're your employee. And that is the tone that's going to be set for the person that reports to them and the way, whatever. Um, I think, you know, con- making the subjective objective as early as possible is really important. So I never had a brand book that I didn't even know what that was. And that seemed very, you know, like what I'm, I'm shooting from the hip. I'm intuitive. I'm the brand, whatever. And that was great for a while. But if you haven't documented what it is that everybody's signing up for, whether it's for, you know, the branding or how we work together or what we use Slack for and what we use email for and when we occasionally use text or not. Like all of those things have to be communicated. Otherwise, everybody's going to be doing everything differently. And it's going to be a completely subjective conversation. And some people have more influence than others. And some people won't use Slack. And some people will write, you know, emails in Slack or post links without (laughs) <laughs> any contacts like I love to do. Um, and so, um, you know, a brand, for example, just a brand book, like a thing that everybody can look at and say, oh, that's what we're doing. Or this is how we work together. That's what we're doing. Because at Nasty Gal, when it began to scale, it became, you know, when someone was having a conversation of whether they should buy, we should buy this sweater or that sweater, it would be Sophia wouldn't like that not what is it that we signed up for? What is it that we're doing? What is right for the brand? Um, And those are the things that can get really dangerous because when it's not objective, you can't hold, when it's not, yeah, when it's not objective, you can't hold anybody accountable to it. And those conversations are impossible to have. (laughs) Um, So, I mean, I would just say like what you can do upfront to set yourself up for success, even if it seems bureaucratic and excessive, it's important because it's going to allow you to scale if and when you're lucky enough for that inflection point to show up for you. Uh, Nicely said. Uh, At your peak, you were worth nearly $300 million on paper. And I'm guessing that was an interesting and exciting moment in time. You talked about whether that was, you know, wholly accurate or not, different story, different podcast. But I'm guessing there was a low point as well. So without maybe sharing the exact low point I'm guessing the decline of the brand and the eventual bankruptcy was, was, was not only devastating to you, but it felt very personal to you. What advice would you give to entrepreneurs that have had a similar trajectory? The highs are the highs and the lows are the lows. What practical advice would you say to business leaders? Think this way. Don't do that. You've been there. Yeah. Tell, t- t- give us a roadmap on recovery. Um. When things are going well, there's always things happening under the surface that you don't see because you're on a victory lap and you're clinking champagne glasses. Um, And in some ways, success makes you lazy. Um, And I think that happened at some, I wasn't lazy, I worked really hard, but whether it's thinking about the future or making, you know, it's like, When the shit hits the fan, you're, sorry, I'm doodling and I'm writing things down right now. But when the shit hits the fan is when people really feel like they have to like hunker down and do things that you should be doing when you're also finding success in your business. Um, You know, the low lows, I mean, I've experienced so many of them. And as a leader, and especially as an entrepreneur, it's incredibly lonely because you don't have any peers. Like, you know, it doesn't matter how senior somebody is who works for you, 
you know, their, their, well, let's just say this is very specifically, this also works for executives, but like you work with your executive team, you tell them something, you tell them about how you're feeling or, you know, something about the future. Everybody is reading every micro yeah. expression on right. your face. Right. Who you talk to is an indication of who's most important in the room. Right. Everybody right. is learning from every single right. thing that you say or don't say. Right. It's terrifying. I had an, ex yeah, I had like a, a CEO once tell me, you know, if you're in an elevator as a CEO, the employee you talk to is the one that everyone else in the elevator is going to think is the most important. Um, and so that when you talk, the first thing anybody thinks about is not what's right for the company or, you know, okay, Sophia, let's talk about that. The first thing they think about in their like primitive brain is, oh shit, survival. They think, am I going to lose my job? You know, what does this mean? Am I not going to get my bonus? You know, how, how am I in the hierarchy of these things? Like, I don't know if that makes sense. Interestingly insightful assessment of how corporate culture works, whether it's an entrepreneurial culture or a Fortune 50. I think it's very insightful. Um, take that a step further. Um, at what point did you know you were in over your head? Hmm. Assuming you were in over your head. I mean, you are, you are an insanely successful entrepreneur. You are, a, you are an ambitious, hardworking, very successful business leader. And at some point, I'm guessing you were in over your head. Those two things oh don't God. negate each other. When yeah. was that? I think I was in over my head much earlier than I realized I was in over my head. I learned very, very quickly. And the curve that I was able to learn wasn't as curvy as the curve that was needed. Hmm. The curve with the business demanded. Yeah. Um, and when you're an entrepreneur or anybody, really, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, hiring executives is, you know, okay, I'm in over my head. I'm going to hire a C CPO and a CTO and a CMO and a CCO and a CEO and a CFO. And these are grownups who, all right, I'm 27. These people have been working in finance for 27 years, right? They're going to show up, they're going to diagnose the business, and they're going to tell me what needs to be done. Well, that's not necessarily the case. So I think when I, it was when those executives came in and I didn't know how to hold them accountable, even though I thought they would just hold themselves accountable, that I, and, and projects slipped and people didn't always do what they said they were going to do, even when they're paid 250, 300 grand a year, which was just shocking to me. And I, cause I didn't, I just do what I say I'm going to do. And I didn't realize that was unique and I didn't need to be managed. Um, but it was only when I started noticing those things weren't happening or once you start verifying those things, it was a little late in the game for me. And I realized like, holy shit, I don't, I have all these people, this is so expensive. And there's all these executives who are amazing and really talented, but I'm just doing something wrong that is, you know, that is allowing things to slip that shouldn't be slipping if I was an effective chief executive officer. Um, I was in over my head when all of our conversations were about implementing ERP systems and, you know, new warehouse management systems and, you know, moving customer care to Kentucky from Los Angeles and, you know, big timelines and board meetings and reporting on stuff that was way deeper than I could understand at the time. You know, I was really spoiled in the beginning in that the company was profitable from the beginning. I, no one would have given me money. I didn't have any loans. Um, I hardly had a credit card. And I never really understood how to read a P&L. Um, I was like, okay, there's this much money in the bank. I'm going to spend this much on inventory and I know I'm not going to run out. I'm going to pay people. It was never close. Payroll was never really very close. Maybe right before the holidays when I was buying a bunch of inventory. But even then, I don't remember ever being scared when it came to money. And then once you plow a hundred million dollars into a business, you hire a hundred people and there's all these other budget line items. And I, I just had no idea 
how to how to even read that or hold the company accountable to that you know those were those were you know sp- spreadsheets with a, a dozen tabs you know <laughs> and i don't think i had really even spent time with a spreadsheet much you know um so i mean it, i was in over my head probably from the beginning yeah. we can always yeah. you know we can all you know hope that we can be so lucky to be in over the head with the success our heads with the success of our business um and the story is very cute that i didn't go to college and that i started an ebay store and figured it out and wow so impressive but if i had it to do over again like i would have loved to have some kind of education or some kind of experience or something like business class um to to guide me because you know i didn't know what i didn't know and most of us don't I think you've described it, the path of every entrepreneur who's been successful or unsuccessful by whatever measure. As you look back at your journey, Nasty Girl and the book you wrote, Girl Boss, is there one pivot moment where you might go back and say, gosh, had I gone left versus right, or had I not hired this person, or not taken that money, or not made this decision? Is there any one particular thing that you say, gosh, that was a slippery slope, and had I made the decision differently in hindsight, it all would have been different or perhaps our timeline or runway would have been different is there any, was there a pivotal moment i think i i think i deferred to my one board member i had two seats and he had one and that was the whole board because i controlled the company and we never really came down to a vote until the very end i think i took too much advice and there are opportunities to either sell the company or raise money that i took his advice on but his you know his motivation is to turn his 350 million dollar you know investment or valuation or whatever to mark that up to a billion dollars in the next round not necessarily to do what's going to sustain the business and if that means a down round it means a down round or whatever and i think i should have pulled rank i think i should have i wasn't over my head and i lost the confidence and i lost my intuition and i deferred to the experts which every you know everyone's like wow you're so like you know coachable and sure i'm coachable um but i really did lose my confidence when i was in overhead and there my head and there were certain things like that like fundraising like possibly selling the company that had i made a different decision my life would be very different and the trajectory of the company would have been very different i love my life you know i don't have any regrets there are things i could have done differently or maybe wish i had done differently but i don't consider those regrets if that makes sense it does because I'm, i'm i'm glad i did what i did you know i'm actually riveted listening to you because i find your journey so instructive for millions of people who are thinking about you know building a brand building a company you started yeah. selling resale vintage clothing and you know and 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 grew this remarkable company with a very public fall right a cover of forbes to to bankruptcy uh, how did you reinvent yourself assuming you reinvented your self confidence your self esteem your brand how have you reinvented your new skills your brand your confidence since the identity was very much nasty girl and for that matter girl boss yeah um I like if anybody ever calls me girl boss again, you know what I mean? Like I'm just like I am so done telling not this story, but kind of writing on the coattails of Nasty Gal and the book's success. Like it's been 8 years since I wrote the book. It was 2014. It's been a long time. So, I think that's a really good question because I don't think I've I people say I'm resilient, but at the same time I'm not doing, you know, I I am I'm doing something that's very different from what I did. I'm still playing kind of in the entrepreneurship space. Um but I still feel like a lot of what I talk about is what I've done in the past and I would really like to spend more time talking about what it is that I'm doing. But I'm also not out there really promoting anything. I don't really do a lot of podcasts. Um and I think, you know, I get a lot of um people are like you're so resilient because they watched me face plant and the bad press and whatever and i kept going and i started girl boss as a business and i did that for 3 years and i sold it and covid happened and i left and started business class and i don't know if i'm necessarily resilient i think i'm i've i'm outrunning something 
that I'm just now kind of figuring out what that is and what like processing the last crazy 17, 16, whatever years of entrepreneurship um, I've, you know, endured. As your self-appointed podcast therapist, oh damn, I think you are resilient. I think, I don't oh, care what it is you're out running or running to. I think there are so many great lessons that I've been captivated and riveted listening to as my own business. I have a partner, an entrepreneur, and thinking about my own brand book, right? And thinking about what am I in over my heads and my head and my intuition and my business sense. And I, I think you are extraordinarily resilient and courageous and forward thinking. To that point, can we end our conversation talking about what's next for you? I mean, you, you've experienced highs and lows that, that people only dream of. Maybe not dream of the lows, but there's so many lessons you've learned that I imagine you could recreate if you chose to a business that would be insanely valuable and productive because yeah, of all that, that you've learned. What's next for you? What's next for me is not doing that. <laughs> I am like so damaged from my own ambition that I'm, I've been pumping the brakes for the last few years and business class is what I'm doing now and it's super successful. And what's next for me is to continue to teach business, uh, to teach entrepreneurs through the program. But I'm not working on a book. I'm not working on a TV show. I'm not starting another business. If I do anything, what I really want to do is be behind the scenes and not be on Instagram dancing. I mean, you don't, don't hold me, you know, uh, accountable to this, but I would rather be investing, you know, I've considered getting into venture, raising a fund, doing my own real estate investing, like whatever. I don't really want to be in front anymore. And I never really meant to, and it was super fun. And I got a lot of access and met a lot of great people. Um, but it's just not my nature to be out, to be out there. And I've done it for a really long time. So What's next is I'm flying to Europe on Friday for three months by myself, and I'm going to see a few friends and uh, spend a month in Paris. And I don't speak French, and I'm going to go to Spain and Germany and uh, Italy and see the Venice Biennale and uh, hang out on an island and not eat, pray, love, just probably eat, drink, and drink. <laughs> and I'm not expecting to find myself, but I'm, you know, found myself now 38 with no kids, single, like, why not? You know, this may, this opportunity may never come again. So it's a little bit of an arbitrary exercise in not working. And it's like your working. gap year. It's your gap year between high school and college, right? As you're going totally. and just enjoying yourself. I, uh, totally. I like you. And I appreciate you coming on to our podcast. I have personally learned a lot. I was a named executive officer in a public company like you. I've written books and have a podcast. And a lot of what you've done I can relate to. I'd like to end with this last question. You said something I think is profound. You said you're damaged from your own ambition. That did not fall um, lightly on me. Can you unpack that just for a little bit? Maybe as guidance to other very ambitious people. I don't really know what to say about that. I think I, I've... I've said yes to everything. And that's kind of a beautiful thing. And there's been a lot of amazing things for me to say yes to. And I've gotten to a place in my life where saying no is really important. And I used to think about saying yes and building my life and making huge commitments and, you know, sometimes being very cavalier about what I chose to do or let happen because I told myself that if I look back at my life, and it reads like an interesting book, then I've done it right. <laughs> but I don't know how well that ages. And I don't know, that's not really necessarily like stability making. Um, and so I'm a lot more planful, if anything, resistant and slow when it comes to what it is that I get myself into with business. Because, you know, what nobody tells you is I mean, and especially when you have investors, you can't quit and you can't be fired. You're kind of like stuck there. But if you're so lucky that what you do takes off, expect it to last a really long time. And especially if it's working, you're not going to want to shut it down. But like, are you going to want to enjoy what comes with every day of doing that? Is that going to be your passion in three years? I get bored. I'm not an operator. I'm great at starting brands. I'm great at curating things. I actually think I'm a pretty good investor and I've done a lot of angel investing, but I'm not an operator. And I think like, you know, 
maybe figure out the things that you're good at. And just because you're good at building a brand or get it good at curating things doesn't mean that you have to be the full stack founder, CEO, entrepreneur, everything. And if that means that you're not as press worthy or it's not as sexy or you're behind the scenes and you build a great company, stay behind the scenes <laughs> if you can, because uh, especially in today's world, it's really hard to do it all right. And you will be judged on a public stage for the things that you do and the things that you don't do by people who have absolutely no idea what it's like to do what you're doing or what's actually happening under the hood. Sophia, do you know who the gentleman Ed Milet is? No. Ed Milet is a California-based entrepreneur, uh, wrote a couple books, speaker, a big social media presence. Uh, uh, he is my favorite interview in 230 interviews in this program. And now we are the world's largest podcast. And I think you are tied with Ed Milet for being no, my stop. favorite interview because I haven't said that lightly. I've learned a lot from you in the last 36 minutes. In fact, our team is going to dinner tonight and we're, I'm sure, going to spend time unpacking this conversation. Thank you for your transparency. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your um, introspection. Thank you for the gift that you've given literally millions of entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, solopreneurs that are going to listen to this podcast three or four times and think, okay, I see myself there. I see myself there. I could see myself being there. And I just appreciate the gift genuinely that you've poured into our listeners and viewers today. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you back here next week. I don't know how we'll top this one, but I'll see you back here next week for a new interview on leadership. <laughs>